Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lori Grieco, and I am a senior field advisor at the National Network for Safe Communities. And our panel today is on strong medicine, refining and minimizing law enforcement. So I want to start by talking about some of the things that we know. And first is that law enforcement is a fundamental part of any violence reduction initiative. And we know that communities need law enforcement, but they need a different type of law enforcement than they have gotten historically. And so, you know, one of the things that we've learned over the years is that we cannot arrest our way out of violence. And so, um, one of the things that Devon said earlier was that we're kind of moving away from punishment and thinking more about deterrence. And so, um, you know, we, when we're thinking about how law enforcement can engage with the communities that they serve, we're thinking about a gentler touch. We're thinking about, um, you know, the least amount of sanctions necessary to deter violent behavior. And, you know, we know that we can get this right. So the idea is that, you know, when we have a collaboration of law enforcement and non-law enforcement personnel working together, we can not only reduce violence, but we can minimize the footprint in the communities that we serve. So um, I'm going to get started by introducing our panel. Um, so starting to my left, we have Derek Oberlander. He is the superintendent with SCI Forest, Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. Next to him, we have Lieutenant Carl Jacobson with the New Haven Police Department. He's the officer in charge of the intelligence unit. Next to him, we have retired Assistant Chief Archie Generoso, um, also with the New Haven Police Department. And next to him, we have Isabel Rojas. She is the project manager with uh, Newburgh. And then we have Lieutenant Matthew Hammer, uh, place-based investigations of violent offender territories with the Cincinnati Police Department. So I want you all to just start by telling a little bit about your current role and how it's evolved to include deterrence. So can we start with you? Sure. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, currently, I'm the superintendent of SCI Force, which is a maximum security state correctional institution in northwestern Pennsylvania. We have approximately 2,300 offenders housed in our facility and about 650 staff. Uh, in 2014, if you looked at the trend line for um, our violent assaults, you would see that it was skyrocketing. and It kind of came to a tipping point in August of 2014, and we had an uh, offender in our institution stabbed two of our officers. Um, at that point, we were actually at a, a statewide banquet for our volunteer banquet, and our secretary, who was Secretary Wetzel, uh, spoke with us about doing something about reducing the violence at our facility. And typically with these ceasefire approaches, and that's one of the things that we've talked about today is not having a competing model, but with a, a ceasefire approach in a community, you're looking at gun violence and homicides, whereas in a correctional institution, we're looking at the most serious offenses. So we're looking at staff assaults. Um, we're looking at multiple offender fight assaults where there's three or more involved in the fight or the assault. And we're looking at any fight or assault where the weapons used are displayed, and we call those prohibited violent acts. Um, we, in 2014, literally, uh, we had our command post open, and it started with a Google search. We went to Google and uh, said violence reduction strategies for correctional facilities. And, uh, and that's a true story. We were, sitting, we, we were sitting in our command post. Um, our whole institution was locked down. And we Googled it, and we came up with a promising approach that was implemented in Washington State in 2011 uh, at Walla Walla at Western State Penitentiary, and they were phenomenal. And Carly Kujith, who was a program director there at the time, uh, we reached out to her, and, and she sent us everything uh, that they had worked on since 2011. And we also, they collaborated with David Kennedy and the National Network in developing the model that they implemented at the correctional facility that was based off of ceasefire from Boston. So we took that, we adapted it to our facility, we came up with a strategy, and we implemented that in 2015 uh, by having our first call in. So I can tell you in 2014, uh, we had 91 staff assaults at our facility. Uh, we had 168 assaults overall. Uh, last year, we had 25 staff assaults, and we had 90, uh, 99 assault misconducts overall. So 
Um, we, we got involved in deterrence out of necessity. Um, we learned that the enforcement part of it alone does not work. You have to have engagement. Um, we were great the first year. We had swift sanctions. We did our call in, did our notification, told our population, if you continue to engage in these types of violent behaviors, this is how we're going to respond. But we did a terrible job with the engagement. We didn't offer any type of credible promise of help. Um, Stephen Laurie with the National Network came out to one of our call ins, gave us a lot of good feedback. Uh, since that time, we've been working. Uh, as much on the enforcement part of it as the engagement. So truly pulling every lever. We're not just doing the enforcement. We're also doing the engagement, the credible promise of help. Um, we've told our population that if we're not responding every day to fights and assaults, that we can engage in meaningful programming. We can do things that are important uh, to our population. So that's uh, out of necessity. We, we got involved with focused deterrence. I'm uh, Lieutenant Carl Jacobson. I want to thank the National Network and Lori for asking us to speak. I'm here with my uh, father figure and mentor, Chief Archie Generoso, and I'll tell you, you know, you talk about an old uh, dog learning new tricks. Um, Archie was the old dog that taught the young guys new tricks, and he really did. And um, he came to us and said uh, six years ago, you will do GVI. You'll do it. And I was like, no, I won't. And he said, yeah, you will. <laughs> and we went back and forth, and I started to do it, and it's made a monumental change in how we do business in New Haven. Monumental. I can't thank him enough and the National Network enough for the changes that we've made in New Haven. Um, you know, he's a guy who stood up in front of the community and said we did things wrong. That's bold leadership, people, and um, I'm just happy to be sitting here with him. Um, just in sharing a mic, actually, for once. So, um, <laughs> so I'm going to make it brief so he has time. Um, and we went from, I got involved in this because I was in charge of making the arrests and stopping the violence. And when we started GVI, we just tried to make arrests and stop the violence. We did call-ins, we did some customs, but we weren't doing the whole thing. And it went from a thing of look first to arrest and look second to do other things. Now it's look first to do other things. And just an example, a great example I have, a year ago we had eight shootings and two homicides in two weeks. And that's a lot for our small city. And, um, you know, we made a few arrests. We made one or two very vital arrests. But the rest, we ended up putting 25 GPSs on probation and parole, people on probation and parole. We did about 30 custom notifications. And we didn't have a homicide in the city for three months, I believe it was. And we didn't have a shooting for a month after all that violence. And there were some serious groups uh, going at it. But we were able to touch enough groups and talk to enough people, and we didn't have to incarcerate them. And I have a lot of different stories of that, um, where we simply put a GPS on somebody and tell them, you cannot go retaliate now. You can't do it, because we're going to know, if you do a drive-by, we're going to know that you drove by. And um, the young men that are involved in that at first get very mad at you, and then a few of them actually realize and say, yeah, you're right. They don't say thank you, and I get it because they feel like we're harassing them in the beginning. But once they get to see me a few times and my people a few times, they get it, and they talk to us. And we have relationships beyond belief. We actually just had a shooting in the city, and a kid was caught, and he said, I'm going to be, uh, Lieutenant Jacobson's going to be disappointed in me. That's what he said when they called him for doing a shooting. That, to me, is tenfold where we were before, and that's what this is all about. My turn, huh? Yep, your turn. <laughs> That and, and Carl's done a lot. Uh, so, um, about seven years ago, uh, I was tasked with implementing uh, GVI, which we call Project Longevity in New Haven, with the New Haven Police Department. Uh, in 2011, New Haven had experienced one of its um, most violent years. Uh, there were uh, New Haven is a city of about 135,000 people. There were uh, 34 homicides and 133 uh, non-fatal shootings in New Haven. There were uh, well over 450 incidents of shots fired in New Haven. Um, and as I said, it was one of the most um, violent periods uh, that city had ever experienced. Uh, because of that, a uh, change in administration came about and I, who had left the police department, have 43 years of, in law enforcement. Um, I retired from the Laven Police Department in the 1990s and went to work for the state's attorney's office. Um, and I returned to the department in 2012 uh, with the task to, uh, um, 
to implement GVI to reduce the gun the gun violence in the city. Um, and we set about doing that. And I set about it with, with uh, some really key people that are in this room today. One being Carl Jacobson, the other is uh, right now, he's chief of the police department, uh, Tony Reyes, um, and, a, and, a, and a whole team that we put together. And we had to change the culture of the New Haven Police Department, and we had to change the culture of the city. Uh, we had to decide to do business in a different way. And that way was to um, prevent shootings rather than investigate them. Um, I start out by saying, in any time I speak, that um, I'm more concerned with preventing the next shooting than solving the last one. Um, and that's how you go about um, shooting reduction. Um, in New Haven, between, the, between 2003 and 20, 2012, there were, uh, they averaged 126 non-fatal shootings a year. Um, from 2013 to the present day, they're at 61. So it's been cut in half. Uh, shootings have been cut in half in the city of New Haven. Um, it, the first time that we ever recorded shots fired incidents was in 2011. There were over 450. Um, I think they're below 200 now um, in shots fired. And that's with uh, Shot Spotter implemented three times uh, the coverage that initially was there in 2011. Uh, so um, it, it's working. And it, it took a team. Uh, there's another individual here right now, Stacy Spell, who's our project manager. Uh, we had bumps in, and bruises in, uh, along the way. And when we first started out, some of our bruises were, were our project manager, some were me. Uh, we, were, uh, we, we, had a, we had a right to ship. Stacy came aboard. And he's, he's, uh, he's a retired homicide detective in New Haven, but more importantly, he's been a community activist all his life. And, and for the last 20 years, he's been in the community uh, working, uh, working as an activist. And we, and we asked him to come aboard. He came aboard. He wasn't a believer at first. Um, I had to sit down and talk with him for a few hours to get him to, to bite the bullet. But he came aboard, um, just as Carl wasn't a believer at first. Um, it's, it's, it's tough. It's not easy to do this, and you got to browbeat people. You have to beg people. You have to encourage people and and persuade people that this new way of doing things really is going to work. And um, it's it, you have to do it every day, and you have to continue to do it. And I'm sure Chief Ray is is after I left is continuing to do that every day to get people on board, to get people to um, buy into this new way of doing uh, uh, police work and this new way of, of, of reducing crime. And the, the one thing that I'm most proud about is that during all this time and during this reduction in, in gun violence, we've actually <coughs> reduced the rest in New Haven, uh, which is unheard of. People think that the only way to solve a problem is to keep on arresting people. We've actually reduced the number of arrests in New Haven. In New Haven, we don't do sweeps anymore or they don't do sweeps anymore since I retired. We, we don't do random, I, 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 I really cringe when I see police departments go out there and do random drug buys and then have a, have a sweep and arrest 60 or 70 people. And it's meaningless. We're targeting the people that need to be targeted, the most violent people. And we're offering help to the, to the, to the people around them. And the community buys into this. The community loves this because they see we're not coming in to injure their 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 community. We're coming in there to help it. I I always say that there's not, and I, I think I think um, David said that today, and and I always say it. We don't have bad neighborhoods in in New Haven. We have some bad people that live in those neighborhoods that we're and they're very few. But that's the people we're trying to correct. So. Um, I hope to talk more about that. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? I'm Isabel. I'm the uh, project manager for the uh, city of Newburgh. Um, I want to thank the National Network for having me. So as you guys heard earlier, David Kennedy stated um, how our crimes went down, our bullets, our body shootings went down. 
And that is a testament to the great work that and the collaborations that we're doing with our police department, with the DA's office, with uh, probation and parole. I think that um, since we had our first call in in 2015 when I came on board, we started to see a drastic change. Um, like you said earlier, it's all about the buy-in and the people that are buying into this new way of business. Um, you know, we went through, we take this so serious, we have gone through, through two social service agencies trying to get the right people on board that are really doing the work. Um, you know, it's evolved into us doing call-ins, custom notifications, and other innovative ways to getting the police in front of the community to see that we're really trying to change things, that we're really trying to uh, keep the neighborhood safe and keep people safe and alive and out of prison. So it's just a testament to the great work that the police department has done. And, you know, I just say that we can't take credit for something if we're all not working together. So I hope to elaborate a little bit more on that as we go on. Okay. And so again, um, thank you for being, for uh, allowing me to be here. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. In uh, 2007, David Kennedy uh, actually joined us in Cincinnati and helped us launch <coughs> what we branded the Cincinnati Initiative to Reduce Violence. And so from there forward, um, we had a lot of great support um, from the University of Cincinnati and from affiliates, and, um, and we really moved forward in projecting a focused deterrence model. Uh, my roles in those included participating in the shooting reviews. Um, I worked in and supervised um, over the course of several years violent crime squads. So I participated still um, in a lot of enforcement actions, hopefully with more precision than in the past. Um, but that was um, effectively my role in working with CERV for several years from 2007 forward. Now I think we reached a turning point um, in 2015 where in Cincinnati, like in some other urban areas, we saw again a spike in gunshot victimization. And so I think um, for the police department and for local government, it was really a critical moment to try to reassess what it was that we were doing to address gunshot, gunshot victimization um, and to take a hard look at focused deterrence and um, to uh, really ask ourselves if it was providing the returns that we were hoping that it would. What um, I'm very glad uh, of the decision that was made was not to abandon focused deterrence, but instead to figure out what other complementary strategies we might be able to employ to strengthen focused deterrence. And so uh, from about 2016 forward, I've worked in what's called place-based investigations of violent offender territories. And so what that really means is for me and my team um, working alongside our focused deterrence partners, we look very, very closely at clusters of shootings, right? Where are the offenses happening? Um, and where are they longstanding and persistent? And in the same way that when we talk about focused deterrence, we know that we need to focus very, very closely on that, that really legitimately small number of actively violent offenders. The where, I think, is the same for us. Um, so we're not talking about neighborhoods. We're talking about street segments. We're talking about a few blocks at the most um, where violence persists. <clears throat> and then I think what is most important about this and has been helpful for us is this is complementary and it leads us right back to um, working closely with focused deterrence, right? Because we know, although we're focused on the where and we know that there are things that we can do to the environment that will impact um, gunshot victimization and the opportunity for crime, we also know that this will help us gain information about what's occurring. This will lead us to the patterns and activities of active violent offenders. Um, and so this will provide us with more opportunities to employ some of the focused deterrence efforts um, and strategies that have already existed. So when we're thinking about employing some of these focused deterrence strategies, we hear a lot of terms about buy-in and collaboration. And I think before we kind of get into the weeds about you know how they've approached focused deterrence, I think it's worthwhile to take a minute to talk about buy-in. Um, and I know Carl and Archie and, and all of you at different times have talked about what it meant to get community support and how you know working together in a collaboration has been so important. And I think 
for everyone in this room, we know that oftentimes when we try to change an entire culture of policing or even community perception of violence, that we can be met with some pretty um, staunch opponents or people that are really resistant to change. So could you talk a little bit, and, and I'd like each of you, because you have different capacities, to kind of just spend a minute and talk about how you were able to bring some of these changes, how you were able to get some of that buy-in from, from the people in your organization? From our perspective, the, the buy-in was pretty simple. Everybody wants to go home at the end of the night. And uh, from a staff perspective, but not only staff, the, the uh, men and women that are housed in our facilities want to be safe. Um, when we, when 2014, when our <coughs> assaults were going off the charts and we, um, we found the violence reduction strategy in Washington State and we reached out to them, we reached out to the national network, but we formed a committee and one of the things that we heard today is bottom up. It wasn't the administration sitting and telling everybody what we were going to do. We brought staff in from every job classification in our facility regardless of their rank. Um, we also solicited the input from some of the offenders that are housed in our institution and we formed a violence reduction committee and the committee put together the strategy and then the staff actually seeing them uh, being able to come to the table and give ideas that were implemented as part of the strategy helped us get the buy-in. Uh, the call-in, as we when we go to and do our conduct our call-ins, we also show some of the data how over the years from 2015 till now, how it has been successful because the perception initially was this isn't working. Um, but when we're able to show our staff that we went from 91 staff assaults to 25 uh, since we started the program, and we're able to show the offenders that we went from 168 uh, the 99 and that our jail is not locked down all the time. We're not continually locking down the entire facility, which interrupts the programming and interrupts the meaningful things that we're doing inside our institutions uh, to make a change, make a difference, make a change. So when they leave our facilities, they're better off than when they came into them. So that's how we've been able to get the buy-in. Yeah, we, we had a tough road too. I mean, with the community in the beginning, when we did call-ins, there was rumor and talk out there that if you went to a call-in, you were an informant. And that's why they were giving you services. And that was bad. Um, and that was hard to overcome. Like, um, so even the participants of the calling didn't want to be there because they didn't want to be labeled informants. Um, and it's really telling when you go to someone's house and do a custom notification and say, I'm here to help save your life. You don't owe me anything. M most of them are done with me and Stacy. The chief used to go all the time. Uh, chief Reyes would come. And we'd say, you don't owe us anything. And they don't believe you at first until you come again and again and you never ask for anything back and you just keep giving out that number for job services. Um, so the thing for us is with the communities, we just have to keep showing up and showing that same face and saying, hey, we're still here. Um, but also success breeds cooperation too. We're very successful in New Haven and we can show, hey, we've cut our numbers, our shootings in less than half. The other part of it for us though is, is law enforcement buy-in. Cops are hard to, to, to get them to do something else, right? I'll be the first one to say it, 22 years and two police agencies later. Um, and if it wasn't for Archie, I don't know if I would have fully bought into this. It took a lot. We butted heads. He's a Yankee fan. I'm a Red Sox fan. Forget it. But, but he never gave up. <laughs> he never gave up. And um, that was the thing. He never gave up on me, my team. And we, um, we were led by him. And... But then it's the other agencies, see, because we can't do this alone. Um, we had a guy taken off life support last night, so he's officially a murder uh, victim. The first group of people I called were probation, parole, um, juvenile probation, street outreach workers, and the youth department from um, New Haven. I have a group text with eight people. They're our lifeline. They will go out on the street and talk to people now to keep it quiet. They say things like, give the police a chance. Let the police do their job. And then they go to places I can't go. But that's the first group of people I texted last night. But six years ago, they wouldn't have taken my text. And I wouldn't have taken theirs. And that's the big thing. And it started with a um, probation officer called Kate Gunning, little Kate Gunning. I called Kate and I said, this kid's one of your kids. He's going to be shot. This was literally six years ago. She was talking about this the other day. And she said, oh, how do you know that? And I said, we know. He's going to be shot or shoot somebody. Well, two days later, he was shot. And I called her up and kind of did my cop way of I told you so, which was, she has a different version of it. I thought I was nice, but. But the bottom line is that's where the trust was built. And then you say things like, Kate, I will talk to anybody that wants to talk to us. 
in the capacity of trying to save lives. And Stacy did the same, and Chief did the same, and, and Assistant Chief Generosa did the same. And you just keep going and going and showing up, and you don't give up. And um, Kate and I have done things like we had a grandmother, terrible situation. Her daughter was killed from gang and group violence. She had a grandson into um, uh, group violence. She came to meet with us. He didn't show up. Um, we talked to her. I said, if you find a gun in the house, call me, and I'll come get it. No questions asked. No questions asked. Now, I have to test it. If it comes back to a homicide or shooting, there might be a few questions. But if it comes back to nothing, we're not arresting anybody. And she left, and Kate said, you're really going to do that? I said, I have to. I just said I was going to do it. And believe it or not, eight months later, she called, and there was a gun in the house. And I snuck around the house with a hoodie up, and she gave me the gun, and um, we did what we had to do. And um, um, it wasn't in anybody's room. It was in the living room. So, you know, there's... We talked to the state's attorney's office all on the up and up, chief. Um, but, but the point is, is we never arrested anybody. Now, I wish I could tell you a good story. So he posted on social media, the thing didn't grow legs and walk away. And, and um, we never arrested him. Now, I wish I could tell you a good story and say he never shot anybody. Well, I want to say about eight months later, he shot somebody. And we were looking for him. And you know who helped me get him in custody with no issues and, and safely? Grandma. That's what this is about for me. What he said, no. <laughs> um, what, what he did mention, Kate, Kate Gunning, who we talked about, was a juvenile probation officer. And for people that are in, with police departments and law enforcement, juveniles, uh, and there's a lot of laws protecting juveniles, and juvenile probation officers very seldom cooperate with the police. We have a fully cooperating juvenile probation department and, and parole department in, in, uh, in New Haven uh, because of the work um, that we've done with them and that Carl's done with them. But to get into the buy-in, and it's twofold. First of all, you got to get the, the community to buy into what you're doing. And that's pretty easy when you think about it because if you're going to go to the community and say, look, we're not going to victimize your neighborhoods anymore. We're just going to go over those so, certain few people that, that are causing the violence. And we know that they're, they're, it's, a, it's a very small number and that's what we're going to do, and we're not going to victimize your community any longer. And, and what Carl said, I've gotten up in front of communities and said, look, we, we used to have, we used to, and I was part of this, I said, in, in the old days, and I'm old enough to say that, but I said I was part of this where there would be a shooting or some violence in a neighborhood, and we'd go up there and we'd lock up everything that was walking, and we'd quiet, quiet that neighborhood down. And then, and then, but we couldn't stay there forever. We couldn't uh, afford to keep those resources in that community forever. So we'd pull out, the crime would return, and what did we leave? A bunch of angry people. Because not only did we maybe lock up somebody that was involved in the violence, and it was random, but we locked up and, and we affected the lives of a lot of people going to work who maybe we, we, uh, we gave a guy a ticket and he lost his license and now he can't get to work, or, or he, uh, we we confiscated his car because it was unregistered and he can't get to work. So he left behind a lot of angry people. So when you go to the community and say you're not going to do that anymore and you're going to go with that very small number of people, um, they sit up and listen. And then they have questions for you that you have to be prepared to answer. And when you talk about GVI, group violence, the first question that your community is going to ask you is, who's identifying gang members and how are they going to do that? That's the first thing they're going to ask ask because they're going to say just because a kid's sitting out there in his pants are baggier or he's wearing a red hat doesn't mean he's a gang member so how are you going to do that so you have to have an answer for them our answer was that we um we stole something from the state of massachusetts there's not a gang statute in the, in connecticut there is one in massachusetts and in that statute they have a gang matrix um on how to identify gang members so we plagiarized that in New Haven, okay? And we took that and made it part of our SOP for our intelligence unit. So we can go to the community and say, look, we have a gang matrix, and they have to meet this criteria, and the, the, the number's 10, their point value has to be 10. They have to meet that criteria before we're able to call them a gang member. And then the community looked at, at us and saw that we made the effort to do that and they were willing to give us the benefit of the doubt then because they saw that we were not randomly choosing some kid hanging on the corner 
just because he was African American or just because he was Hispanic and saying that he was a gang member, we actually had a, a matrix, a criteria that we had to live by before we can name them a gang member. And that went a long way into gaining the trust of our community. And then our community, our, our project manager, who routinely is in the community every day, every night, um, um, talking about what we're doing in GVI and trying to, uh, to, to bring the community together, it's hard work and we continue to do it. The more difficult sell was to the police department and to the guys. Uh, I'll be frank with you. Um, I was an old school guy myself. I mean, I commanded a narcotic unit. I, you know, um, to, 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 to tell cops that there's a different way we're going to do things now. And although, and, and they, they automatically assume that it's going to be soft on crime. They automatically assume that they're not going to be doing what they think is quote unquote police work. Okay. Um, and you have to convince them that it is. And you have to convince them that what they're going to do actually is going to make a difference for a change. And it takes a while. And, you know, you have to have a hammer and a chisel, and you can see the holes in his head. But you have to, but you have to, you, you have to keep at them. And then you got to get a little lucky, and something breaks, and, and something happens, and the bell goes off in one or two people. And those are your leaders. And then the other people around them start believing in it. And frankly, there were people that didn't believe in it that you got to get rid of. That you say, okay, I think your time is to be in detention, you know, watching prisoners. Or your time, and not, not that it's anything wrong. <laughs> it's altogether different in a local police department. Or your time is, your time is back on a beat or back in, you know, back uh, pushing a, 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 a supervising patrol. Uh, or maybe it's time to go to the dog pound. But you have to make it clear that this is, and, and it, it all starts at the top with, with the chief and the assistant chiefs. You have to make it clear that this is the way we're going to do business in the New Haven Police Department right now, or your police department. And we're not going to accept anything less. And if you don't want to be part of the solution, then you're, you're going you're gonna to be moved aside because we want people that are going to be part of the solution. That's what it takes to get buy-in. It takes persistence. It takes belief. And you have to have a fidelity to the, to the, to the strategy. And if you don't do that, you're going to fail. Okay? And you have to have the backing of your mayor. You have to have the backing of your chief. They have to believe in what you're doing. Each, each city has to, any city that's been successful will tell you it's because their chief or their, and their mayor believed in the strategy and set forth to, to go forth and implement that and told people if you don't want to be part of the solution then you're going to get out and I think that's what's really important here and that's what really makes a difference in your communities to have that that person at the top buy into it and then to, to work its way down to where his detectives just got an award because they're probably the two most um, I don't know, valuable investigators you can find. They have arrest records that would boggle your mind. And what do they spend their day doing giving out cards telling people to go see Stacy Spell to, to, to try to get services when they're out there? They just caught a guy tonight, today, who had just done a shooting. They witnessed the shooting, ran him down and caught him. Okay? And they're probably out there now giving people out in the neighborhood cards saying, contact Stacy for some help because we don't you know, end up like this. So, that's what makes it important. That's what's gratifying when you see that your people have bought into it and then take it a step further. And we can get into how, how that was taken a step further later. I just want to jump in quick because Archie keeps mentioning Stacy Spell. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Stacy Spell for a number of years. And he actually came from the law enforcement side. He's also a community activist and works as the project manager in New Haven. So he is really the brawn behind the operation in New Haven? I don't know, but Stacy, could you just raise your hand? And I just want to acknowledge Stacy because he's done amazing work in New Haven and just give him a quick round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Isabel. So, <laughs> so from my capacity, how do you get buy-in? Um, you know, you guys all mentioned the whole thing about the community. Once you tell someone that you're going to do something, you have to do it. 
And we all know that there's a small window to get it done. Like you said earlier, your project managers out in the community, that's something that I continue to do. It works well for me because if I'm out there and I'm letting them know what GVI is, people are asking questions, especially after a call-in. When you're out there doing customs, another good thing is that the lieutenant that we have that goes out with us, he talks to other people that are sitting in the porch or they're sitting outside and they're asking, why are you knocking on their door? You know, and he's like, oh, do you need help? And he's um, con you know, giving the, his card out, giving my card out. So it's explaining to the people, you're not just knocking on somebody's door, now you're walking away while the neighbors are sitting there, some of the neighbors, and they're like, okay, what's going on? So when you're telling them, when they're seeing a lieutenant coming up and the police officers, and they're like, this is so non-traditional that you're here to tell somebody, I want to help you, I'm here to offer you help. They're looking at you like, yeah, right. But calling them and making sure that you follow through. I have come now, I mean, I have plenty different titles. The other day I'm coming out to coffee shop. Somebody's like, oh, there goes a social worker that helps everybody. And I'm like, the what? So I'm looking around and I'm like, okay, if that's my title, I'll take it, you know? But that's a testament to, you know, the guys that, uh, one of the guys that actually I, we, I was helping out, I'm in a line in the post office and he's like, miss, miss. And he's, and I'm like, oh God. And he's like, listen, you know, I did this, this, and this. And I'm like, okay, shh, shh. Like, we're in a full line of people. You don't have to do that here, you know? And he's like, no, 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 I did this, I did that, thank you. And I'm like, okay. Great, you know, but I felt bad for him because I'm like, it's your privacy. We've told you that, you know, this is confidential, but he was like, he didn't care. So he's the same guy that I walk out of the coffee shop and he's talking to three guys and he's like, take her card, she's gonna help you. And, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and now when I see the guy, he's like, oh, there goes the social worker. And I'm like, be the social worker, <laughs> as long as I'm helping you. So I say the trust that you build with people, <coughs> especially in the community, what we've done well is when we have done um, community outreach, you know, the cops do a really good job at the community pop-up barbecues and things like that. So it's like the community is seeing that the police department is investing into them. Um, it's a time for them to come out, there's no questions asked, and the community feels safe so they can sit in their porch without having to worry about their safety. So that also works really well. Uh, we've done forums in the past where we're explaining, where we're, there's transparency, where we're telling them. This is what the program is about. This is what we're here to do. And the, we are not going anywhere. And like I had mentioned earlier, you know, taking serious when you tell someone, we've gone through two, two social service agencies. And non-traditionally, and I don't know, uh, Lori, if this has been done before, but the project manager, now I'm the social service provider as well. Um, so that is a testament of saying how we are, you know, we, we, if we're gonna offer the help and we have people that are working with us that are not keeping their end of the bargain, we take this very serious and we wanna make sure that we're being effective. <laughs> so if it takes, um, you know, others taking on, rolling up your sleeves, going out with people and doing the work, that's what I've been um, fortunate to do. You know, a lot of the times I tell the guys, I've gone to the school board, I've gone to different places with them and they're like, yeah, right, you're not gonna show up. Social service agency, you know, you can tell sometimes and you pick up on certain things and how you make people feel. We have, I, we've come across a lot of guys that I've realized that are, you know, can't read. And they get frustrated, they go down to the social service agency. So instead of embarrassing them, I say, oh, I'll meet you there. Or I'll be like, oh, let me see it, let me just read it and I'll just read it to you so I can get it done quicker without even letting them know that I already know that you can't read. You know, and then later on, it's offering them literacy programs and things like that without embarrassing them. So once you build that trust with them and you're rolling up your sleeves to go out there with them, I think that the work becomes even more meaningful and they're really believing that you're out here to help them. And so I think in 2007 and then again in 2015, both on the people side and on the place side, in Cincinnati we had enough people who were willing to try something different, um, try something new, trust in the leaders that were saying this is a better and, and, and new way forward, um, that we were able to get the strategies underway. And I don't know why that is, but, but I think we had just enough, right? We certainly had plenty of people who are skeptics um, who would sit on the sideline and wait for it to fail, right? But in both cases, um, the successes that were generated were probably the best advocate for, um, for the value of the programming, right? And so I think I, I feel like I saw focused deterrence grow in strength over the course of years for Cincinnati. Um, and I've seen the same thing with Pivot with the place side of things. Um, I now, I, you know, I still don't know why because, um, you know, it's such a challenging strategy um, to try to launch on the place side of things, especially 
And so I don't know why when we launched this and build a new operational unit, there were far more applicants than there were positions. I don't know why that was. Um, I think part of it was because there is sort of this natural thing um, in committed police officers, that probably rarely talk about it, but there's this natural thing that they're frustrated that their work isn't more successful, right? Um, and so if they see an opportunity to add more value to their life's work, then I think they, they really are willing to step up and do that. Um, and I definitely saw that. I had an opportunity to interview for a new position maybe a year or so ago for that same unit. And a dozen applicants for one position and every single one of them in their own way came in and said, I am frustrated with feeling like I'm still spinning my wheels in my current assignment, um, doing something that's more traditional than what's offered here. Um, and I've seen enough of the project work to feel like I would feel like my contribution had more value in this place, right? Um, and so that was really interesting to hear. And from some of the most talented, some of the most veteran officers that we have, and that's probably maybe a natural thing too, right? You've been on long enough to get frustrated. <laughs> uh, probably actually helps um, with that curve, but it's helpful to me because then I'm drawing more experienced officers, right, who have more well-rounded skill sets. Um, now again, from the place perspective, when this strategy was launched, this was from the city manager's office, and this was with the recognition that the things we were going to want to do required a lot more than just a police department. Um, and it required all city departments. And so there was a challenge there in generating buy-in from Department of Traffic Engineering to say your priority is gun violence. Um, that's a little bit of a, of a mind break for some people <laughs> uh, to after maybe 20 years of engineering for the city, you know, having to do with traffic control to be able and willing to recognize that the kinds of things that they held the keys to also could have an impact on violence. Um, and so I think we worked through more of that probably than anything else in the past couple of years. And again, though, with success comes buy-in, um, with willingness to look at things a little bit differently, at least maybe enough patience um, to give it time and see if it'll work. I think we got a little bit more buy-in. And then I think the third piece which is helpful from the place side and I think helps um, generate legitimacy from, for the focused deterrence efforts. Um, when we do this place work, it's very visual, right? Um, this isn't broken windows in Cincinnati. This is very, very highly focused. Um, but it is place change and some of that place change is very visual. And I think for communities that feel like government has ignored them for a long period of time, Stepping into a room with words is sometimes just not enough, right? Um, it's really hard, I think, to generate that willingness for a community that's been ignored for a long period of time to give it one more try. And I think that we found some success because some of the early interventions on uh, the place side are visual. They're changes that people see walking by a street corner um, you know, driving through the community. And so if we've committed, it's very, this is very community engaged. So if we've committed that we're gonna do this thing and maybe we don't yet have buy-in, but then they start to see the changes that we committed to take place, then I think we snowball some of that buy-in from the community as well. Okay. So um, we talk a lot about, you know, minimizing our footprint and we talk a lot about legitimacy and that really comes through um, identifying those that are driving the violence and not focusing on just the broader community. And so I wanted um, Carl and, and Matt specifically to just talk about the process that you use to identify the people that are driving the violence. Take your shooting right there. First. <laughs> Carl. So, so um, there's lots of ways. I mean, we have a, a morning intel meeting in New Haven where we meet with the DEA, the FBI, probation, parole, pretty much every agency you could think of every morning, well, four mornings a week, and then on Thursdays we have CompStat, but 
when those meetings started, there was a, there was a method of buying on that too. You know, the FBI would show up but not really tell us anything, you know. <laughs> then when we got, <laughs> sorry, anybody from the FBI? <laughs> um, but um, then when we got rolling and we got successful and we were solving robberies over different city and town lines and we were really um, chipping into the violence and getting some um, players off the street and getting guns, everybody started to buy in. And everybody wanted to be a part of it. I mean, we even had postal showing up most of the time, too, and uh, they still show up occasionally. Um, and, and it benefited everybody because we were being successful. We were getting the right people off the street. Now, to that topic, it takes – Archie's the one who started it. All the silos in law enforcement, DEA would do their thing, FBI would do their thing, we would do our thing. We eliminated that in New Haven. You know, if you want to find something out, come to the 10 a.m. morning intel meeting. I have people who still call me, hey, Lieutenant, we're trying to ID this guy. Come to the 10 a.m. morning intel meeting. Constantly say that. And you know what? They show up. And through that uh, collection of agencies, we're able to identify. So we'll put up a shooting. Hey, last night, shots fired in this area. Most of the time, the New Haven guys have a good beat on it. I have an awesome intel unit. Some of them are in the back. Great cops, best cops we got and they'll come up with something but every now and then we don't know we don't know everything and someone from the FBI might say ah oh, there's a guy over there we had issues with and then probation will say oh I have a guy that lives right around the corner and he does this and uh, just the collection of intelligence the collection of the intelligence and bouncing it off one another and coming up with a game plan we don't always get it right we may say hey we think this shooting happen for this reason and these two guys are beefing and we'll actually have people on the street tell us no you guys are a little off on that it might be this but we at least are open to listening to that we're open to listening to other agencies there is a lot of humility in that room you know um and now we've come to the point now where the FBI is doing some really good cases you know the ATF and and, and DEA are doing some really great cases but you know what they're doing they're cases that we need done related to violence and that's about it yeah, they have their little drug things off to the side, but their major cases are based from help of New Haven and they're violence oriented. And that's priceless. Like instead of us just operating alone and trying to get this done alone, we have everybody doing it. Um, yeah. So yes to what he said. <laughs> um, and, and he said this, but I'd like to say it again um, to the community engagement. Um, we probably know, but we fail sometimes to prioritize that most of the time, many people know who's doing the shooting. And the question is just, are they going to tell law enforcement or not, right? Um, I think it's the rarer event when not that many people know what happened. Uh, so, so we need to continue to prioritize that. Also, within these project sites, when we do this place work, so we'll take a three block area, we'll declare it a project site, we'll do work from the place side for two years. Um, these are areas where shooting is highly, highly concentrated. Uh, and so when we begin that project work, one of the things that we do is I assign an investigator to take every violent offense for the past two years and effectively memorize them, right? Um, read every note about every violent offense within these small spaces and look for those commonalities look for the things that might not have been properly prioritized in the first place um, look for the opportunities in some cases to revisit a case that's been closed um, you know find those gaps that might have happened within the system that we need to address in another way and so that's valuable to us because when we do that you know, we take a look at two years worth in a highly active area. Um, we generally find three or so individuals that we have not um, had mentioned in an intelligence gathering session like was just described, right? Um, the guys are usually really good at a lot of this, um, but to have this as a backstop to identify what might have fallen through the cracks for one reason or another is helpful. And then I think the last thing that we do to try to help identify the right people is a daily look at every call for service in the small area. You can't do this for your city, right? You can't do this citywide, but in an area where um, it's as active as it's been, you can, 
take a look at a dozen or so calls for service in the area. One individual, look at all those calls every single day and just scan the notes. So on a gun run, is there a description? A lot of times we don't find the person on a gun run. We close the run. There's little to no follow-up on that, right? That's another place to help identify patterns, nicknames, and eventually lead us to who it is that's actively violent in the space. So as we get into the focus deterrence work itself, um, one of the things that we really talk a lot about is it's two pieces. We talk about communication um, and how we get out to the folks that we're working with, what the new rules are going to be and how they're going to be engaged with. Um, and the other is the actual levers that we use. So um, Derek, could you talk first about um, how you're communicating the change in the way of doing business with, with the inmate population that you work with? We did, uh, again, our first call in was in 2015 and we identified uh, offenders from our housing units that were either block reps or were validated security threat group members that could hear the message at the call in and then take that back to the, to the community. Our facility, we have one of the higher concentration of validated gang members uh, in the state. So we wanted them to come and hear the message. I know Archie said a good point about um, part of the enforcement is the close associates. And that was one of the biggest concerns was if I just sit and eat with this, uh, this person, I'm going to be labeled as a close associate. And we also have a very uh, detailed uh, process for validating someone as a, a security threat group member in our institutions. But we brought them over. Uh, we gave that and me the message of that violence was no longer going to be tolerated and then how we were going to have sanctions that were going to be swift and certain with that. And then obviously we, we followed up with a credible promise of help. Um, we Every uh, offender, when they're received at our facility at an initial reception, they're given a, a pamphlet that shows them what our violence reduction strategy is, how we'll respond to those prohibited violent acts, what we do for the help, and then we do the ongoing with the call-in. So that's sort of the, the way that we continually update. And we also have a uh, dedicated loop on our cable TV system that runs, that plays what our violence reduction strategy is and how we'll respond to the prohibited violent acts. Um, Isabel and Carl, could you just talk about custom notification delivery? In terms of the customs, um, we have conducted, I think we're almost at 200 um, since it started. Uh, we typically, if there's a shooting within 24 hours, we're going out with the police department um, to talk to the opposite group members and also the group members uh, so they won't retaliate. Uh, what we do really well is getting into these individuals' homes. Um, you know, at first, you knock on the door, the first thing is, you know, having everybody, you know, mom is either opening the door and you're like, listen, nobody's in trouble just to get people's guards down. So I know that you had asked earlier, Laurie, about, you know, how, oh, that was one of the questions about how do people feel when they see law enforcement coming in with you? Um, at first, they're not happy, right? Some people don't open the door, pretend they're not even there. But one of the, uh, one of the um, memorable customs that we just recently conducted, I, I want to say how, you know, the, the young man, there was a recent shooting last week, and the young man was sitting out on his porch and did not come to the living room. And mom, you know, he came to a call in before. At first, you know, mom is like, quiet neighborhood. We're like, can we come in? We don't want to talk to you out here. You know, so your neighbors won't listen. And mom is, and I told mom, listen, I remember you. You know, I was here to help your son before. And she was like, okay, come on in. We go in, he didn't want to come out. Um, one of the officers said, the quicker that you come in here, the quicker we will leave. You know, mom offered them to sit down. Just to see the, you know, this, this young man was in prison, got a chance to go away to college, came back, and just to see the conversation. Once he saw the officers just sit down, his guards went down, and just to see them exchange in conversation about what had just transpired and how he was feeling about it, and just their advice, it was, a total different scene after that. Um, another thing that we do well is uh, probation. Sometimes, you know, a lot of the times you find guys give you the wrong address. You don't have, they move around constantly. So that's constantly a challenge. So one great thing that we do is we call probation, we call parole to make sure that we have the right address. When are they reporting? We will sit there with them and wait when they're there. Probation is really good at calling us up, hey, they're reporting today, such and such time, come on up. 
and I usually go up, meet with them, and um, deliver the message there to them. So I think that what we're doing well in our community is following up right after those uh, custom notifications, um, calling them up, you know, giving them the phone number. I, I always like to ask a family member, when there's a family member present, I think there is such a different such a different way to do it because it's like a light bulb goes on for the mom and it's they're reiterating that message to them so within days you're getting a phone call from mom saying hey i wish for this you know i've been talking to them about getting out of trouble i can't deal with them you know this is what they need help in so once they start seeing they that you're helping the family out they get that buy-in so i think that that's what works well for us is getting the trust from the family when we're knocking on those doors and uh Lori asked me to just briefly say what our customs are like. So under the GVI model, a customs for somebody that's not on probation or parole and that could be called in, that can't be called in, because for the call-ins, we have people on probation and parole. But we've kind of um, averted from that. We'll pretty much custom anybody. Um, and the custom is for some, you know, you have, uh, like Isabel said, you have an incident that occurred and you want to get to in front of people and talk to them as soon as possible. Um, there was a situation where a kid was murdered. Um, myself, Stacy, and, and Chief Generoso were out on the street within eight hours talking to family members saying, don't retaliate, let us do our job, we're sorry for your loss. Um, with the customs too, we sometimes do packets. If we're going to pre-think about, we have time to think about who we're going to go custom and we're not doing it on the fly because a serious shooting just happened, we'll actually do packets and we'll put in their criminal history and a letter from the chief and some other information, maybe some social media pictures. So when mom goes, oh, he doesn't hang out with them and I can show him a social media picture of them throwing up gang signs and hanging with those, with some certain people, that kind of helps too and that bolts with uh, the, the mother. If, if the person's not home and there is an aunt or a mother or a father there, we'll give them the packet. And that's just as strong because they'll say, oh man, I didn't know he was into all this and then I'm sure they're getting a talking to when they go home. So we'll, with the customs, we're just trying to get the word on the street um, as quick as possible to, to stop any retaliation. So when we think about pulling levers um, as a means of deterring violence, you know, and, and we think about law enforcement, we there's always that sort of enforcement kind of stands out. And as we try to sort of minimize that law enforcement footprint, we look to do more of the deterrence and less of the actual enforcing, and even using sort of a lesser continuum of sanctions. And you know, the meaning that we want to use the minimum sanctions necessary to reduce violence. So, you know, as we think about that, I wanted to kind of give each of you a chance to just talk briefly about some of the ways that you sanction. And I, I wanted to start with Derek first because, you know, when you're thinking about the prison population, so often I've heard people say things like, you know, this guy's in there for life. He's got nothing to lose. What can you possibly do to deter this bad behavior? And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about some of those, the way that you're able to kind of pull levers and use some sanctions to to reduce violence, and you, and you have. So can you just talk about that? Sure. Um, with our strategy, if, if there's, again, we're looking at the staff assaults, the multi-inmate fights, and then the fighter assault where weapons used are displayed, we immediately locked down the housing unit where the perpetrator of that act resided. In the past, we'd locked the entire institution down, so 2,300 inmates would be locked down as opposed to maybe 126 inmates. Um, and then we attempt to identify if it was a group-related or gang-related incident. If it was, we identify their close associates. Uh, we put restrictions on the close associates, which could be up to losing their commissary, losing yard privileges, losing some of their visiting privileges. As a, as a way to deter that violent behavior. And in the past, what we'd see is we'd see two, two inmates start to fight, and then you see more join in the fight. Well, now you'll see two inmates start to fight, you'll see other, and someone get ready to join in, you'll see other inmates pull that inmate back because they know, while we're not condoning a fist fight, because that's typically, that was one of the first things we heard is we're condoning fights. We said, no, we're not. We're just targeting the most serious offense. But we'll see the inmates pull the other one off because they know it's not a prohibitive violent act. Um, so we're also getting a lot of good intel. Every one of our facilities has intelligence lieutenants and captains. And if something's going to get ready to happen in the past, we'd find out afterwards. Um, now they're getting information before something happens because they don't want to get locked down for that 36 hours. Um, so again, that's a deterrence part of it. Um, the help part of it, uh, inmates, and we 10% of our population is serving a life sentence. So we have a little over 45,000 inmates uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, 
little over 10 percent are serving life sentences. But for the most part, they're your stabilizing force inside your institution. They, they want their institutional routine to, to not be interrupted. They want to engage in the meaningful things that they are engaging in. So typically in our institution, they're not uh, able to live on a, a plus a minimum security unit. So we took one of our maximum security L3, L4 units, and we put things on there. They have weight equipment on there. They have a law library uh, on the unit. They have ice machine on the unit. Um, we also do some incentives, uh, progressive incentives, to help uh, con get them to continue to engage in pro-social behavior. So those are some of the things from the deterrence and the uh, in enforcement, and then obviously the help. Um, we have you know a large population of our inmates that struggle with addiction issues. We have a large percentage that are poorly educated. We have a large uh, percentage that, you know, we can help if we're not continually responding to fights and assaults. We can work on that meaningful program um, programming. So whether it's a mental health issue or a substance use issue, um, that when they leave, they can be better off than when they came into our system. Carl, did you, did you want to add anything, Carl? Or Archie? Yeah, so, so um, when when we have to when we have to um, implement sanctions, um, the idea is uh, to to do it with with the uh, least amount of enforcement that you can and still get your message across. So um, a typical thing may be if a lot of most of the people we deal with are either on some type of supervision, parole or probation. So the probation officer may call this person in and says and say, okay. Instead of visiting me once a month, now you're going to have to visit me once a week. Okay? Um, obviously, they don't want to do that, and so that interrupt their, interrupts their lives in that way. Um, we'll go make home, um, home visits with, with parole or probation. They have the right to go in, in without a warrant and search a person's room. Okay? Um, it's an inconvenience for them. We've come up with guns and other can't contraband in their rooms when we've done things of that nature. But it's another, it's, 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 it's less than yanking them off the street and arresting them. And it still gets your point across that there's a consequence to being part of a gang that's become the violent gang in your city. Um, we've, we've gone up to uh, pe um, people knocked on, on, on a door uh, because a, an, an individual is living with a woman who's on Section 8 and said, look, we, we know that... John Doe is living with you, and he's not supposed to be in this. So you're going to have to tell him to leave, or you're going to risk losing your, using, you know, losing your Section 8 status. And we've never gone to Section 8 and had anybody pull their, a woman's Section 8 status. But just the threat of doing that, just the inconvenience, and what we put this guy through, it gets the point across. So there's ways of... of, of, of uh, Getting your point across without having to put somebody back in jail. Um, we, we like to get to the point in, in Connecticut where we can put a guy um, in jail for a weekend um, on probation and parole, like they do. There's a there's a program in Hawaii that does that, um, which has been very effective. Because what David will tell you all the time, he's not back there now, I guess, but. It's swift and certain action. It's not necessarily the severity of the action. So if you could put a guy away for a weekend and cause him not to go to a party that weekend, okay, it's going to affect his life, and he may, he may think twice about doing what he's doing. And you, you've, you've, gotten, you've gotten across to him that you are going to touch him, and you can mess with his life if you want to, without reaching that thing where we're going to put him away forever. Because the jails can't hold anybody forever, and we're not going to arrest ourselves out of this stuff. But if you could, if you could touch them in a significant way that inconveniences, that lets them know that you're there, it's going to have an effect on the on the violence in your city. Matt or Isabel, did you want to add? I think what I would, uh, what I can say is, um, you know, we continue to visit you. Whether you've come to a call in, next time we're going to do a custom, we'll do another custom. Um, also, what I've done well is develop a relationship with that parole or probation officer and say, hey, they had an appointment, they were supposed to go, they didn't show up, you know, how can we, you know, can you reach out to them? And certainly I've gotten guys that will call me within the hour and be like, why did you tell my, my parole officer that? And I'm like, listen, I've been trying to reach you, we're really trying to help you. 
So until you get the help, you take the help, I'm going to continue to try to reach out to as many people as I possibly can. And that works sometimes. Sometimes it just doesn't. But some stuff does work. So I think it's just being consistently, you know, just keep trying. That's all that we can um, possibly do with. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, uh, continuous reaching out to those influencers um, who can hopefully have an impact at some point is important. Um, obviously, this is on a sort of a sliding scale based on the severity and based on what we know we can prove, right? Um, sometimes bond revocations or bond modifications, making those appeals to the court um, may be appropriate. Uh, sometimes that saves a life. Um, I, I think in addition to that, something that, you know, it's a little bit surprising for me, I think local government in a lot of cases is reluctant to pursue civil actions against third parties who facilitate or acquiesce to some of the activities that we're talking about. And for me, that's always been sort of an interesting thing because you've got a criminal justice mechanism that is, um, in some cases, very willing to apply felony charges and incarcerate folks, but in other cases, um, you know, is, is much more reluctant per, to pursue a civil action which does not relate to incarceration, right? And generally is front-loaded on proving any sort of a standard before there is any kind of a consequence. Um, and so I think that's an opportunity to address some of the issues as well. So I have lots of questions, but um, and I could keep them here all day, but I wanted to make sure that we give everyone in the room an opportunity to ask some questions. So. Um, we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions. Hi, good afternoon. My name is uh, Renita Francois. I'm with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice here in New York City. And I first want to commend you guys for what sounds like very um, good work on your part. Um, and I, so my question is basically, you know, we've, we've heard the words um, trust and the right thing to do. And um, I haven't really heard much of, and I hope you can elaborate on um, the sort of next layer of that, which is the why. I think we're at a moment in this country where we are dealing with um, law enforcement and um, the history of structural racism in this country and the treatment of communities of color um, when it comes to interactions with law enforcement. And so when you come into a community, and we at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice have to do this a lot with our partners, uh, when you come into a community you know, before they're even ready to have a conversation, it's like you have to deal with that, you're confronted with that history. And so I'm curious in law enforcement agencies where it can be very rank and file, you tell me to do something, I'm gonna do that, or you get out. Um, how are you equipping your officers and your partners with the tools and the education and information they need to understand that history? And also um, to be able to have those conversations to build the trust that would lead to this being su successful so that it's sustained after you're gone. Because you know people can do what you tell them to do as long as you're around, but if we wanna really make change, we have to make sure that it's in their own, their own minds, their own desire and understanding of the history and want to change. Absolutely, and uh, it starts with someone like Chief Generoso who went to community meetings and stood up and said what we did in the past was wrong. So it starts with that leadership. But also Stacy Spell and I constantly teach a course to our academy um, and we're working it into in-service police legitimacy and procedural justice. And to explain why um, when you go into that community, maybe you're the brand new officer who hasn't done anything yet, but this is why, this is what your uniform means. And Chief Reyes says it better than me, he just was in a community meeting and said it. That uniform has a lot of pain and suffering for other people. And it's on us to teach the cops that people already hate you and this is why, so this is why you need this approach. This is why you need to be nicer and, and, and kinder and, and come from a different foothold than what we were taught. Because 22 years ago, I was taught, control the situation, take them down, blah, 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 blah. Well, we're trying to not teach that anymore. And we're trying to teach that. That damage is there. So when you go into communities, uh, minority communities, that damage is already there. So you have to come from a different position than we used to come from. And we're trying. We're teaching the police legitimacy and procedural justice. Um, we're having more community meetings. We just sat in a community meeting with the chiefs. Um, and it was really one-sided. We were basically getting yelled at by the community, but we took it because that's what we're there for. We have no other place to go. We're not going anywhere, the police. So we 
have to find something different. And this is different. And I'm proud of this. And I'm, and, but the thing that bothers me, and, and I say it every time I speak, there's approximately 17,000 police agencies. Okay, 17,000 police agencies. Lori just told me only 25 do GVI. That's terrible. You know what I mean? Honestly, that's terrible. Because more of us should be looking to do this. And I'll tell you a quick story. We have, my guys are great guys, plainclothes detectives. I have several different units. We were involved in an officer-involved shooting in January. Guy pulled out a gun. My officers had to fire. He was injured but not killed. Um, he did have a gun. Um, I immediately got calls from the community to ask if my people were all right. Because they know who we are. They know who we are, and we're not dirty cops, and we're not bad cops. And they wanted to know if we were all right. And that, to me, was like, that's what this is all about. So if we're coming at the community in this way, trying to help you first and giving you an option, obviously it, 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 it creates some of those good boundaries and good borders. So you're absolutely right, um, but we can only keep trying. No, Carl said it. Uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Hammer, um, at the beginning you mentioned uh, some cooperation with the University of Cincinnati. I'd appreciate it if you would elaborate on the cooperation uh, between your department and the University of Cincinnati and how they directly and indirectly uh, help you. And Carl, I'd appreciate it, uh, cooperation between your department and Yale. Okay. So from my own experience, um, the development of the partnership between the University of Cincinnati and um, CPD really, yeah, it started to some degree in 2001, 2002. Um, I think it really blossomed through um, the focus deterrence work, um, serve. And so UC provided a lot of support and guidance in helping us to understand how to, you know, effectively, effectively how to be data driven, right? Um, how to uh, evaluate to some degree the success of what we're doing, the importance of gathering quality information, um, and constantly using it to help make operational decisions. Um, you know, that grew to the point where I watched an agency change, I think, and really transform and become more data driven. Um, this would have been maybe 2009 or 10 when the partnership led to the Chief Scholars Program, which was a cooperative between uh, both institutions to allow um, select people to apply, be selected by both the chief and the university to attend um, master's degree programming at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be one of those folks. Um, so, I, so I really have um, direct experience in the value of that. But there's probably been, and I'm approximating here, but it might have been about 20 of our uh, officers who attended that and graduated with master's degree uh, in criminal justice from UC. And of course, you know, now you're returning into the police agency with a lot more information um, about best practice, about where the research community is on some of, the, some of these issues, um, be it rightly or wrongly. Um, but at least a more informed understanding of a lot of these conversations that are happening, frankly, outside of police departments sometimes, right? Um, and so I think first seeing these things operate in isolation from each other and then seeing a lot more close cooperation and conversation and some mutual understanding of the positions of different institutions has been really helpful, I think, for us in Cincinnati. So, just restate that question. So, um, <laughs> um, we get cooperate from Yale. We work the city together. Um, they actually just took our former chief and made him assistant chief. And I'm a little, I'm being honest, they took like four or five good cops from us recently. <laughs> but, you know, that happens. <laughs> um, but I, I will say that they're, I'm working on a program with them. And Stacy and I just sat down with two of them, uh, two of the Yale community police liaisons to work on a a program to help us fund a cops and ballers program that the city and the state don't have money for anymore. So Yale's valuable. Um, Yale funds our street outreach workers, right? And street outreach workers to me, and I haven't said enough about that today, they're my lifeline. They are 100% my lifeline. And um, they can talk to people that I can't talk to. And they, you know, there was a strained relationship for years. So you know what we had to do? We had to come forward and talk to them first. 
oh my God, you know what I mean? Like I still argue with some of my cops. You got to come first. You know, you got to come with your hand held out first. But since then, the street outreach workers have helped us immensely, immensely. And I don't mean they're giving us information or they're helping us control the violence in the city. And that's funded by Yale. And Yale saw that, that that was important. Yale also has Yale Child Study for us. I think it's a groundbreaking program for kids to deal with violence. And um, that's huge. After there's a violent situation, Yale comes in with um, clinicians and helps the kids in the neighborhood. That's that's. A rarity we've had that for years oh, right chief like probably 25 30 25 years so Yale Yale's a great partner and has done a lot of good things for the city maybe it's not a coincidence UC took some of our great cops as well <laughs> <laughs> any other questions how is that flow of communication between you and the street outreach workers did everyone hear that can you just can you ask a little louder yep. Uh, I'm interested to in know how is that communication funneled between the police and the street outreach workers, and then how do you guys stay separate but connected? So um, if I want to say 10, 10 years ago or so, a street outreach worker witnessed a homicide and never gave the police information, and that relationship was dead for a while. Um, we've rebuilt that relationship. And, you know, it's like I was going to say about a lot of this stuff. It's people. It's Archie Generoso. It's Tony Reyes. It's Stacey Spell. It's Carl Jacobson reaching out. I have close connections to all the street outreach workers now where only one or two would talk to me before. But it was a trust building where we had to, you know, trust each other. We had to talk to each other. We had to trust each other. And then as my men saw me do that, they began to do that. So there's certain street outreach workers in certain areas that are connected to some of my detectives and others are connected to other of my detectives and pretty much they all talk to me. So it's direct communication with the police department. Um, when there's a shooting, I send a group text to them and say, there's a shooting, because they're gonna be sent by Yale to go talk to the victims and the families immediately. That happens immediately in New Haven. So it's come a long way, but I would say it's direct communication between us and them. And so, No, well, not all the time, but there'll be, you know, um, there might be a ceremony for somebody that was killed or whatever. I can walk right up and talk to them now. I couldn't years ago, but they're not embarrassed to talk to us, you know. Um, at During the Freddie Fixer Parade, which is a big parade in our African-American community, I was on the sidelines with my detectives, four or five street outreach walkers stopped to hug me, you know. That didn't happen before, but it was because I trusted them and they trust me now, and the same thing with my people. But you, you have to understand, when we're talking about exchanging information, they're not informing on people on the street. Right. That's not what we're, that's not the, the exchange of information. The exchange of information may be to Carl, Carl, you know, uh, we had an incident a couple of years ago where a 14 year old was killed and shot. At, during the same, was shot and killed. During the same time, there was a, another shooting in another part of the city. And the outreach workers came up to Carl and came up to me, actually, and said, Chief, it's tragic what happened to that 14-year-old, but the real problem is that shooting that occurred on, in Jocelyn Square because that's going to that's going to that's going to end up with retaliation. That's where the real problem is. I know you got to solve that, but you've got to address that problem. So that's the kind of communication that you're getting. You're not getting that John Doe did this. What you're getting is they're giving you the hot spots. They're telling you what to pay attention to, and in turn, you're giving them look. This is what's happening here. See if you can go in and, and talk to some people and get them guys to calm down. So I'll literally, that group text I was talking about, I'll text them names of people that I'll, and I'll ask them, can you please go talk to them? And they'll text me back, we talked to them or we didn't or whatever. It's an open line of communication, but the chief's right. I'm not asking for details of who did the homicide or anything like that. Just how do we stop the violence? Because they're on the same path. And the community's on the same path. The community doesn't want the violence either. So once they trust you enough, it works. So I think we have time for one more question, if there's, if there's one out there. Hi, I'm Ed Chunt from the Center for American Progress. Chief, you mentioned that at your, in your opening remarks that uh, you cut the violence rate or the shootings in more than half but you also cut arrest rates as well. So was that a conscious, 
Was that a result of other conscious related policy decisions or was that just the fact that you're focusing on this targeted group and not the gang sweeps, not the direct sweeps that you were talking about before? Yeah, it, yeah. It, we we, we conscious, consciously decided that we weren't going to do random arrests any longer, that we weren't going to do the drug sweeps, that we weren't going to do the uh, you know the, the roundups and the and we weren't going to go into a into a neighborhood and start locking it down. So yeah, that's why the re, the there was a reduction in in arrests because they weren't random anymore. Um, um, we we weren't going into communities and shutting everything down because they had a shooting or two. Okay, we were concentrating on who was doing those shootings rather than concentrating on territory. We were concentrating on individuals rather than areas. Okay, um, uh, I know a lot of parts of the country they're 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 really into hot spot policing. Okay, I don't believe in hot spot policing. I believe in hot people policing. Okay, there are hot people out there. Stacy, that's his phrase. You're hot. There are hot people out there. Okay, not hot spots. Okay, and and that's what we. We, we set out to do is to address the people causing the violence, not the neighborhoods they live in. So it, yes, it was a conscious effort not to make those sweeps. Whenever, you can ask Carl, even when we started, I won't let them accumulate arrest warrants. I will, I, and I'm sure Chief Ray is now the, is the same way. We're not gonna let them accumulate arrest warrants to, to go out and, and, and make a splash in the newspaper. Because that's going to harm communities. If you got to, if somebody, if you have an arrest warrant for somebody, go serve it. I don't want to save 15 of them and do it at once. I want you to go serve the arrest warrant now for someone that did something wrong. We're not going to stop enforcement, okay? But we're not going to just do it to, to make a splash in the newspaper. Or, you know, I just recently in Connecticut, a, 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 a city in Connecticut made 68 drug arrests, okay? Um, all at once. They did a raid, they did a, they, 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 they put a bunch of people together, they, they did a bunch of undercover buys, and then they, they went out and arrested 68 people. And I'm sure all of it was random, none of them had any sense to do. So how, how does that make a difference? Our guys know when they're going after somebody, they're going after them for a reason, not, 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 not some um, violation of a drug law. So I think we're out of time, but I just want to take a moment and just um, just tell you that if you do have any other questions or you're looking for any other information, uh, come find me. I'm happy to connect you with with any of these individuals up here. You're welcome. <laughs> but they, but they're 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 great resources, and they're more than.